The New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with a child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The word of the Lord. Last Sunday evening was such an impressive and inspiring experience. Carols by candlelight brought together over 700 people to participate in a wonderful program of beautiful Christmas music. Accompanied by brass and percussion from the Knoxville Symphony, our handbell choirs rang their bells, the chancel choir sang their notes, Jason played our rental organ, and all 700 plus of us who were there that night joined together singing O Come All Ye Faithful and other favorite Christmas carols. What a fantastic night it was. Afterwards, a friend of mine from New Hampshire sent me a message on Facebook. I had posted to my wall some videos of the performance, and he had just finished watching them. He was awed by the size of the crowd, and the quality of the musicians, and the choirs. And he was especially struck by the beautiful backdrop formed by the design of our new pipe organ. Marty, he wrote, the pipes look like angels' wings. You know, I hadn't thought of that, but I think it's true. I think he's right. When I mentioned this observation to someone at Wednesday church, he looked up and moments later said, they do look like angels' wings. Can you let this image just take shape in your mind today? Picture that whole congregation, our choirs, the musicians, all of us together, joining together with the angels of Bethlehem singing the songs they sang that night long ago. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward all. Last Sunday evening, we were singing with the angels. And today, I want to invite you to keep on singing with the angels. Angels fly all over the Christmas story. Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, is told by an angel that they are going to have a baby in their old age and they are to name him John. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary to tell her that she has been chosen to give birth to the Savior, the long-awaited Messiah. And of course, we all know about those shepherds out in the fields. Do you remember what they were doing? They were keeping watch or their flocks by night. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angels, the shepherds, were told by the angels of the Savior's birth in Bethlehem. And so the Bible tells us they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby 
lying in a manger. Christmas is full of angels singing the songs of God. And one of the most beautiful angelic songs is the one Joseph heard one night, some nine months or so, before Jesus was born. Now, you have to stop being a modern-day American for a moment if you want to understand this story. You have to look through the lens of the ancient Middle East to appreciate all that is going on here. In, in that time and place, girls were betrothed to men when they were as young as eight or nine or ten years old. Marriage had nothing to do necessarily with romance or even love. It was basically a business deal contracted by two families and more specifically between the girl's father and the man who wanted to marry her. Once the contract was agreed to, something interesting took place. The girl was brought out of the back room and the young suitor held out a cup of wine to her and he said, take and drink. And if she did, if she took the cup and drank the wine, it meant yes. She was agreeing to the marriage. Have you ever noticed that when you take communion, the Lord holds out a cup of wine and says those very same words? Take and drink. So now you know what the Lord is asking of you when you come to the communion table. But there's more. If the girl agrees to the engagement and subsequent marriage, the future groom says these traditional words, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Do you recognize those words? They're the same words Jesus spoke to his disciples as he prepared to leave them. They had accepted the cup of wine he offered. Now, he said, he was going to prepare a place for them where they could be together forever. The words of Jesus around the communion experience are basically the same words that began marriages in the ancient world. And this is why the church, we followers of Jesus, are called the bride of Christ. Hold these thoughts whenever you come to receive communion. So Joseph and Mary got engaged. He went off to build them a place to live together. She remained in her father's house until she came into puberty and could bear children. Then, once the fiancé had finished building the house, he would come back together with a big parade of friends. This is why the Bible has so many stories that talk about Jesus, the bridegroom, coming back for his bride. Now maybe you can imagine Joseph and his buddies joyfully marching down the road toward the house where Mary lived. They are singing and dancing and celebrating what will be a festive wedding. But when Joseph goes through the door of Mary's house, he gets the shock of his life. Mary is pregnant. Now here is what I love about Joseph and why I think we ought to admire him. The law of the day called for the stoning to death of a woman who became pregnant out of wedlock. That still happens today in some parts of the Middle East and in other parts of the world. You can certainly understand the intense sense of betrayal and outrage Joseph must have felt and how tempting it would be just to give Mary over to the religious police and let them have their way with her. But that's not what Joseph did. Matthew writes these words. But Joseph, being a just man, did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace. 
so he decided to quietly divorce her. He broke off the engagement. And then, I'm sure, he ran all the way home and cried. Sometimes in life things happen that hurt you so deeply all you want to do is crawl into bed, pull the covers over your head, and never come out again. Right here today in this congregation, there are people who bear deep, deep wounds of some disappointment or some unkindness or some failure or some betrayal. Are you one of those people? Do you know someone who's going through a time like that? I think this story about Joseph can help you push through this moment in life because, like you, Joseph had arrived at one of those places where you feel utterly helpless and don't even have the energy to put one foot in front of the other. But like Joseph, you have something going for you. God loves you. And look at what God does for Joseph. God sends an angel. I believe in angels. Do you? Of course, I'm married to one. Although Sandy's maiden name, Angel, is spelled with two L's. But truthfully, I do believe in angels. The Bible says we all have guardian angels. Book of Revelation talks about angels having charge of churches. I wonder what our angel looks like and sounds like. But beyond what we may read and study about angels, I think that most of us know the personal experience of a stranger who comes to help at just the right time and in just the right way. There have been times in my life when I've been so low I couldn't go any lower and certainly couldn't get higher, but felt lifted up by some unseen presence. I know some people who are convinced that their family pet is more than a dog or cat. Oh, I believe in angels. And look at what the angel sent to Joseph does. The angel sneaks into Joseph's dreams. Have you ever awakened in the morning with a thought on your mind about something you should do? Like call your mother or send a note to someone you haven't seen or heard from in a while, or volunteer your time in some important way. Pay attention to your dreams and the thoughts that come out in the morning because sometimes angels whisper messages there. And did you notice the message the angel brought to Joseph? It really comes in four simple parts. Here's part one. The angel says, Joseph son of David. Sometimes in life we can let our problems overwhelm our identity. In other words, our what becomes our who. So someone diagnosed with cancer begins thinking of themselves as a cancer patient. Or someone who has lost their spouse thinks of herself or himself as a widow. But cancer is a what, not a who. Widowhood is a what, not a who. And whatever problem you may be facing may be what you are facing, but it is not who you are. You are the person your dog thinks is the best human being ever to come down the pike. You are the person other people believe in and care about. You are the offspring of a family tree that is rich in tradition and life. And most important of all, you are a child of God. You see, you can't deal successfully with the what's. You can't deal successfully with the what's of your life until you catch hold of the who you are. David, uh, Joseph, son of David. David who conquered kingdoms. David, who ruled justly. David, 
who committed big-time sins but found even bigger-time forgiveness. David, who God loved as a man after his own heart. You are somebody, and who you are is stronger than what you are facing. So listen to the song of the angels. Part two, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Now, there are some people you should never take home, ever. People who are a danger to you or abusive toward you or can inflict harm on you or your family. These are not the subject of the angel's message. What is happening here is that in the eyes of the world and in the eyes of Joseph, Mary has sinned and fallen, and the message of the angel is this, so love her. Love her. There is no one here today who is without sin. There is no one in our world who has not messed up and probably messed up many more times than we could possibly know or they would possibly admit. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what are we going to do with all these people? What are we going to do with all the sinners among whom we live and among whom we are chief? When I was living in that little narrow world of fundamentalism I found myself in long ago, all I could do with sinful people was judge them. It was so easy to see the speck in someone else's eye without ever noticing the log in my own. It almost seemed as if my Christian duty was to convince people how awful they are. Do you know some religious people like that? That's their whole thing. They want to convince you how awful you are and how disgusted God is with you. And they try to convince us that our only hope from being saved from the flames of hell is to become a fundamentalist like them. Back in those days, I wasn't listening to the song the angel sings. The song that says, don't be afraid to love the Marys of this world. Some have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Others have fallen short of the glory of good old Marty and appear to me to have sinned, but time eventually reveals that they are actually living out the will of God that Marty just didn't see at first. And do you know what? I've learned over the years that loving, fallen, very human people is much more effective in leading them to God than judging them is. Don't be afraid to love. That's the song of the angels. Part three. What is going on in her is from the Holy Spirit. I was talking with one of the woodworkers the other day, admiring the beautiful pieces of furniture or piece of furniture he made for us. I won't tell you who it is or what it is that he made, but, but when I said to him, you know, you've made not only a gift to us, you've made a gift to God. And all of a sudden, his eyes filled up with tears, as if his soul was somehow stirred by the idea of knowing that what he had labored over was sacred that through the humble working of wood, he had done something beautiful for God and had fulfilled a divine purpose. One of the things you and I need to know about every person we encounter is that the Holy Spirit is at work in them. God breathes divine purpose into every human activity. And God is able to use even our failures and even our sins to accomplish His will in our lives. So when you encounter a stranger or gather this holiday season with your family or run into a friend, tread very carefully because the Holy Spirit is at work in them. And learn to use words that affirm them 
and help people see themselves as part of the larger purposes of God Almighty. And that leads us to part four of the angel song. Mary will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The angel tells Joseph that he has a crucial role to play in this miracle of God's saving the world. Do you see what you have accomplished here by starting this church and creating our first sanctuary and now this new beautiful worship space? Do you have any idea of what it is that you have accomplished? Not, not for me and not even for yourself, but for God. Do you know what you've accomplished for God and God's purposes that will still be going on long after we are no longer here. You are people who are a part of a divine purpose. Every family you provide a turkey for at Thanksgiving, every child you help save from sexual abuse, every young person you provide a scholarship for, every house you help build for a family, every mail you deliver to a frail elderly couple out in the county, every man, woman, and child who steps through these doors to seek God is someone in whose life God is at work as a part of his plan for the salvation of the world. And you are a part of it. I sometimes wonder how Joseph must have felt those nine months or so later on Christmas night in the stable, together with Mary, his wife, and the baby lying in a manger. What must he have been thinking as shepherds came and magi arrived and the angels of heaven sang Gloria? Nine or so months ago, he could not possibly have imagined that he had such an important part to play in the purposes of God. Do you have any idea how important you are to God and what God is doing on planet Earth? Well, listen to the song of the angels. We hear them singing most clearly at Christmas, but they are actually singing all year long, if you dare to listen. But don't just listen to the angel song. Come and join the song of the angels. Amen.
instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. Lord, make me, even me, an instrument of your peace. And now may the music of the spheres fill your hearts with angelic song during this Christmas season and guide, be a guide to our step toward peace on earth and goodwill to men. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. 